Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the MLOps Live webinar series, and more specifically to our first technical track session, which will give you hands-on guidance and practical advice on everything MLOps related. Um, my name is Sahar and I'm Aguazio's VP Marketing. It's great to have you all here with us. As most of you already know, this series of webcasts is all about deploying AI in real business environments and bringing data science to life. Today, we're going to be discussing a topic that we get asked a lot about by our customers, how to detect and remediate concept drift in production. In today's environment, there have been great changes in human behavior. The coronavirus has completely altered the way that we shop, research, consume, act, and so on, and this has caused big shifts in patterns of data. These shifting patterns means that some models, which were previously working fine, are now no longer predicting with the same accuracy, which creates some big challenges for data scientists and engineering teams on how to detect which models have been affected and how to get these AI applications up and running in a seamless way and continuing to generate business value. And to deep dive into this topic, we have with us today Yaron Haviv, Iguazio's co-founder and CTO, and Or Zilberman, our expert data scientist. Yaron will start us off with an intro into this fascinating topic of concept drift and MLOps in general, and Or will then share methodologies for concept drift detection and options for remediation, as well as practical tips on adjusting models, setting up alerts, tracking error rates, and so on, and a live demo on handling drift detection at scale with automated MLOps processes. You had some fabulous questions on the previous webinars, so we will make sure to leave plenty of time to answer your questions today as well. Um, please write those in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address them all. We've now put everyone on mute, and the session will be recorded and sent to you afterwards, so no need to worry about recording. And let's uh, get started. Over to you, Yaron. Hey, thanks, Sahar. Do you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Uh, good. So next slide. Uh, before we dive into uh, concept drift, uh, so let's talk for a minute about MLOps and moving to production. And uh, next slide. You know, one of the, the key challenges that we see, and we've spoken about it in the previous uh, sessions, is the move from research environments to production pipelines. In research environments, everything is relatively in small scale. It's done in using manual processes. You extract some data, whether it's in CSV files, Excel spreadsheets, or some um, data that you brought um, on small scale, you run it in Jupyter with using all sorts of data cleansing or scripts that you've written to clean up the data. You're running training, sometimes using automated or cloud frameworks, and you generate a model. Once you've generated the model and evaluated it, you need to bring it into production. This is really where the fun begins, uh, where you have to essentially start bringing real data. Real data is not something that comes from Excel spreadsheet or CCs. It's data that's streaming in through JSON and Kafka streams or data you have to grab from operational databases, from APIs, et cetera. You have to take all of this data and prepare that. Prepare meaning joining, aggregating, um, and building the feature vector that's going to be used for training. This data set usually is much larger than what you would fit in a, in a memory. Then you run into automated training processes in sometimes trying different permutation, different parameters and algorithms. Once you have a model, you have to serve the model. This time we're going to focus on the serving part in the MLOps uh, pipeline. So you have to serve the model using uh, functions and those functions uh, answer to various requests that come with real-time features. And those requests are then compared with the model which presents some prediction and respond back to the user. In parallel, what we wanna do is monitor the full activity of that model, everything that goes in and out to that model serving function so we can leverage that information to build sort of a feedback loop, meaning detect drift and uh, react to drift as or is going to show us in a minute. Uh, next slide. So then again, we're talking as usual about sort of a continuous workflow where the first step is collecting data. Then there's a ne next step of preparing and normalizing 
uh, data and creating those feature vectors, finally um, training the data and testing and validating that and deploying. But now we're going to focus on a feedback loop that after you deploy it, how do you bring back data and use it for detecting drift, detecting the accuracy and quality of your model and retraining or using other methods for remediation. And next, star. So what is really this drift uh, detection and or is going to give us all the uh, theory behind it in a minute. But what we understand is that data keeps on evolving, especially if we're looking at the COVID uh, use case. We see that various patterns are going to change. People are buying things they didn't buy before. Uh, people have different habits that they didn't have before. That means that if we've trained models on a certain types of data sets, on combinations of data sets, we've gotten a certain uh, models, but then if, if the data sets or the behaviors or the patterns are going to change, that means that our models are no longer going to be accurate and they're going to become obsolete over time. And this is a very serious problem because if our model goes down from 95% accuracy to 60% accuracy, we have a problem, we, we may lose money, we may uh, create all, all sorts of biases, and um, that's something that we have to react to. It's not sort of something that we, you know, it may be nice to do, it's going to be very crucial because all models become obsolete over time, that's sort of this uh, thing uh, iterates. And next slide. So when we're talking about this entire pipeline, that starts with ingestion and preparation, and then followed by training with AutoML or hyperparameters, uh, followed by validation of the model, and finally a de deployment of the model. Uh, we see that we also have a feedback loop. Once we've deployed the model, it's going to generate matrix. Those matrix are going to be used for uh, analysis and also be stored back in the baseline feature store and be used for uh, training again. So the approach that we're uh, using in order to automate the entire flow, as, as Orr will show also in the demo, is essentially using functions. And the notion of serverless function which makes this entire pipeline uh, very simple. It's using a set of open source projects uh, called Nucleo, MLRAN, and Kubeflow in order to automate this entire pipeline. Uh, with that, let's move to Orr to give us the theory and action. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Sam, can you please uh, put the slide? Okay. Yep, just one second. Next. There we go. Yep. Okay. So uh, the first thing uh, I want to begin with is really what is concept drift. Uh, so when we are talking about concept drift, uh, what we are talking about is really a change uh, in the relationships between uh, the data that we receive and the target variable y, what we want to predict with our models uh, over time. We can see such examples uh, as lately with uh, COVID-19, we generally uh, took all the data that we had before and completely changed <coughs> uh, our uh, predictions, uh, either from the side of the consumers that are changing uh, the way they live uh, and from the governments that are now actually imposing different kinds uh, of laws that also uh, makes prediction uh, based on the previous laws, uh, basically not uh, reliable, uh, rendering our models almost useless. Uh, I want to give a few uh, more examples about the uh, concept drift so we can get a bit of uh, a feeling for it. So a similar use case uh, that we can see uh, concept drift around is for example, smart grid, uh, electricity management, where people try to predict really how we can manage uh, the electricity flow throughout the grid. Now, there are some unpredictable part that changes over time uh, from renewable energy uh, side, such as wind. Wind patterns change, 
and basically every time there is a change in seasonality or how the wind goes, uh, also the uh, pattern of how much uh, electricity is made is also changing, causes some uh, changes in the models that we need to apply. Uh, apparently this is not uh, an easy problem as was uh, studied uh, by a lot of uh, large bodies dealing with this. Uh, so basically we can see that there is a lot of uh, concept drift both between different seasons and also sometimes a uh, rough concept uh, drift happening from uh, storms and things like that uh, that can really change the uh, prediction that we have on how much electricity is really going uh, to go into the network. Another example uh, that can be nice is self-driving cars. Uh, basically, you are driving on your car on a lot of different uh, settings, and every time you move from one setting uh, to the other, for example, moving from a dusty road uh, to, some, to a paved one, or maybe uh, suddenly rain started uh, dropping, uh, what happens is, is that there are a lot of specialized models that each knows how to work best only with its own uh, <clears throat> set of uh, features and conditions uh, for the road. So by tracking uh, all the different concepts that we receive from the data, uh, we can uh, navigate through the different models, apply the best model that we need as uh, the data is coming and as uh, the concept change. Now, there are a few ways in which concepts uh, can change. It can be uh, an abrupt uh, concept drift like we've seen on the COVID-19, suddenly inside in terms of uh, one week or two weeks, we could see the whole world changing, countries from one week to the next started to do, uh, to close their flights, close uh, all the markets and so on. It can be a gradual drift, Maybe uh, something is happening uh, in the market and it takes some time uh, and it can take a few weeks, a few months, uh, but the market is uh, slowly changing. Uh, we can also have a type of recurrent drift uh, like seasonality, which is a nice example. Uh, you have some models working better in summertime or in wintertime. Maybe if you're in tourism, uh, you know, you have uh, vacation time and so on. So it can also be reoccurring uh, as well. Let's and go to the next maybe, uh, To add on that point, that may indicate that there's also sort of a missing feature, if I understand correctly. Uh, we could have trained putting into, um, uh, putting the seasonality into our model to begin with, no? So uh, a lot of the concept drift can be uh, really related to the fact that there are some things uh, from the real data that we either cannot uh, detect, you know, features that we don't have, maybe some uh, measurements that we can't measure, uh, for example, or we can't process. Uh, and those relationships between the things that we can see that are not in the data uh, is uh, probably what is moving this uh, shift between the labels that we want to predict and the feature vectors, the raw data that we get from the model. And so yeah, it is uh, related. If we go to the next slide, uh, Sam. Okay, so here I really want to get a bit more into this definition of uh, concept drift. Uh, we'll go a bit in the Bayesian route of how inference work and Concept drift as a term is really uh, made of two different kinds of drifts. Uh, one is called virtual drift and the other one is called real drift. Uh, now, both of them can really uh, mess with your model and your data, but usually uh, when talking about virtual drift, what we're talking about is changes to the prior. Uh, our PX, our raw data is changing. Uh, now, why is this called virtual drift? Why is it not, uh, as we see, a uh, real drift? Because changes in the features doesn't necessarily indicate that there is going to be any change in the decision boundary of our model. Meaning that, uh, as you can see uh, from uh, the different pictures, we can see different concepts as they lay in the data in red and blue on uh, the left side. 
Uh, so even if the red and blue are uh, getting a big uh, part or moving a bit uh, from uh, side to side, as long as it doesn't affect the decision boundary of our model, uh, the data can change, but we will still be accurate. So uh, sometimes, as I said, this prior uh, drift can happen and it will not affect us. Of course, on some uh, occasions it will. On the other side, and, uh, side, we have the real drift, which is basically our class conditional probability or the posterior probability of the model. This talks about the relationship uh, between the target variable, between our Y, what we want to predict, and the features that we have. And in those changes, uh, as we can see from uh, those pictures on uh, the right side, the actual decision boundary is moving, meaning that if there was some kind of threshold made uh, between one picture, on the next picture, the accuracy rating of this model is going to be a lot worse. Because, as I said, the decision boundary uh, moved for the model, and now we cannot uh, predict correctly anymore. Um, as we can see below, uh, there is also uh, some more nice uh, change showing how original data uh, can look uh, in red and uh, green. We can have a real concept drift, a change between uh, the PYX, and we really can see how both the points moved, but also the decision in boundary uh, moved as well. On the other side, there is the virtual drift where we can see how the points moved, but the same decision boundary is still working for us. So the prediction will still be accurate. Uh, let me give a real uh, life example. We can look uh, at a spam classification, for example. So if new words are added to a dictionary, it doesn't necessarily change uh, our model. I can learn new words, not usually, uh, but not all the words that are being added will actually change what uh, it means uh, from a spam point of view. Of course, words that already were uh, uh, classified as uh, spam words uh, are still spam words. On the other hand, uh, a real drift will occur if the intention of the user changes. So if suddenly, uh, for example, uh, you know, we all receive uh, spam regarding some uh, medicines, for example. So if a user suddenly now really is looking for some kind of uh, medicine, so uh, when you will receive this email with all the keywords that are related uh, to spam, uh, because everyone gets it, it will not be spam for him. He actually wants to receive this, uh, uh, I can say, medicine-related uh, emails now. Uh, so this is a real concept drift. We have the same data, same user. He goes in uh, uh, to his email boxes every day, but on this day, the concept changed. He really wants to look for uh, those uh, medicines, and this will not be... Uh, yeah, or there is a more uh, there is a more concrete example. You know, Corona used to be a beer, now it's yeah. a bar. Exactly. And maybe this is a good place to pause for a minute. And there are a couple of questions. Um, let me just see here. Is the difference between gradual and recurring that the gradual in gradual the drift converges? This is a question from the chat. Okay, so uh, the difference between gradual and? Recurring. Okay, yeah. So in gradual, uh, what will happen is that you will move from one concept to another, but the transition between concept uh, one and concept two, we can say, happens throughout a long uh, time period. On the other hand, uh, when we talk about recurring concept drift, so we talk about something that will happen. It can be abrupt, up, and then it will go back to its previous state. Uh, there could be some kind of mixing, like you can be in some uh, cycle. Uh, uh, for example, if you highly seasonality, you know, around uh, uh, the year, uh, winter, summer, and those seasons, so the changes are usually not really abrupt. They happen on the course of a month or two. Uh, so you can see both recurring uh, concepts coming from each season 
but also they are not moving in an extremely fast pace, but it does happen on uh, the course of a month or two. That's great. Thanks, O. And we have another question. Is concept drift a non-stationary process or just inadequate data for describing the stationary model? So concept drift, uh, we talk about the problem, usually you are talking about non-stationary uh, data. Although, as I will talk uh, uh, a bit uh, forward in this talk about how to actually uh, build a system that is well, you'll see many techniques that are related uh, to each type of use case. Sometimes you have a real, we can say extremely non-stationary data that changes all the time. Uh, so in this uh, case, you may use some type of uh, models or a system like online models. Uh, on the other hand, you may have, you can say simpler things like uh, these uh, seasonality changes, uh, or you can say a more gentle uh, type of drift that can be monitored uh, regularly. And we'll take just one last one before moving on. If the problem relies on data that has concept drift, doesn't that mean the historical data used to train the model also had concept, dr concept drift? Doesn't this mean that unless we understand how fast and how drastic the drift, the problem selected was inappropriate to modeling? So <clears throat> when preparing the data set, uh, I think this is something that will show up doing analysis. Uh, if you go through the actual features of the model and sample them at different uh, points in time, you will see that you are receiving uh, both different vectors, different statistics on the data, but also uh, you will see that actually the accuracy uh, changes. Uh, the model, I guess that uh, the model wouldn't really know how to do uh, the classification well, when it receives a lot of different concepts. You can look at the left side where we see, where we show the virtual drift. If, for example, you have uh, some kind of mix of uh, those four model, four uh, concepts, and they appear in your data, uh, so the model will have to kind of navigate the way between what's the best that I can predict when those four concepts uh, are available are in the data. On the other hand, if you build a concept-specific model and you can relate the data that you have to the specific uh, concept, so you can choose a model that uh, will more accurately predict uh, on your data. So basically, you can move from a lower-performing, more general uh, model to a model that really is uh, you know, proved, you can say, to be related up to some extent to the data that uh, you're seeing. Great, thank you all. We'll uh, move on now so that we have enough time to cover everything. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, um, so I think we can uh, continue. Uh, we'll go over now the methodologies over really how to build the concept drift aware uh, system. Uh, we know that we have a model, we have the data coming in, as Yaron showed in the beginning of, on the pipeline, and we have this data, we have the model, uh, it's predicting, and now we really need to think how can we uh, address this problem of drift, either uh, prior drift, virtual drift, or our concept drift. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> there are many considerations into how to build this type of system. Uh, the first consideration can be availability of uh, labels, for example. Uh, in some use cases, we have a stream of labels coming in, for example, uh, when we're doing attack, uh, we know if the user clicked or not on, our, uh, on the ad that we showed him uh, in a matter of seconds. Uh, we can close and see if a CPA, if an action was done, uh, in an hour or so, and we can update the model uh, very regularly and track it. On the other hand, if we are doing a risk analysis for loans, for example, it may be that I'm giving loans for five years or three years, and I won't be able to say if my risk model was accurate until the people will actually pay their loan. So I need to wait until the end of the loans given by the model 
So as I said, can be a year, two years, three years, until I actually have the correct label uh, for this model. So this is something that we need to keep in mind when we build the system, because it's nice to have all the theory, but at the end of the day, we need to build uh, something real that we work with what we have. Uh, so we have multiple ways of actually addressing, uh, uh, addressing it. Uh, if we have label, we can use more statistical methods as uh, we'll see uh, soon enough. Uh, we can also do, if we have some availability of labels, or maybe we are doing some kind of semi-supervised uh, learning, we can uh, do active learning and things like that that can help us. Uh, and of course, we can try and use some unsupervised uh, algorithms too. Uh, regarding now actually how this system uh, should work. So as you can see, there are four main components. We have our memory, our learning part. Uh, we have the loss estimation and the change detection. Now we receive the data and the data goes into our memory. Uh, those are basically the samples that we receive. And you need to think about this uh, whole system as a holistic system. It covers both how are we going to do the prediction and how are we going to train the model later on when we know that concept drift may be coming. So the first thing is really the memory part. Uh, when we are talking about concept drift, we talk about time windows. At the end of the day, uh, there is a concept drift form that started, let's say, two weeks ago, and it changed up to now. So we need to think about when we receive our data stream on how many samples are we working or how are we really updating our model? How are we going to create uh, the new training set uh, that we will use to train the model next time uh, on the new data? Are we using a fixed window or maybe we are going to use some kind of variable window size? Uh, now, the variable window size really can be uh, interesting as we can couple it with a change detection mechanism. So we will only select samples if some kind of, uh, we can say, concept drift uh, alarm went on and we think those are really special and we need to use them. Uh, or, as you know, we can set it on some time frame or a fixed uh, size. Uh, the other thing around memory is the forgetting part. So we are getting this stream of new samples in. We need to think now how are, on the other end, are we going to forget? Uh, because as we said, the concept is changing. It can be abrupt, it can be reoccurring, but it has this time frame. We need to uh, find a way to both forget uh, very uh, old samples that we had in our training set. So this can, uh, for example, can be uh, when we do retraining on a fixed window size, so I immediately forget everything that came before the window that I'm training on right now. On the other hand, I can also do some kind of gradual forgetting. I can add weights, for example, so that each uh, sample in the model will be weighted according to how recent it is, or I can even tie it into a change detector that will give weights uh, based on how fitting they are uh, to the uh, training set that we had. So we can kind of uh, make sure that either recent data really will be taken into consideration when we retrain in the model, or that uh, those are special uh, kind of samples uh, that we are working with, uh, and they will help us uh, teach our model more, you can say. Uh, the other part, the next part really is uh, how do we uh, change, how do we detect uh, the change? Uh, so we have our change detection uh, paradigm here. I'll go into it uh, and explain a bit more uh, uh, next. But we have a way of tracking uh, what uh, our model is given. This can sit both uh, on the memory of the data, tracking virtual drift, our priors, and also receive uh, all the loss estimation, as you can see, uh, through one and two, uh, and get the labels and predictions so we can track our model accuracy across time, and we'll go a bit more into it uh, in a minute. Uh, 
we have our loss estimation uh, part, uh, which really talks about how do we uh, <clears throat> know if those samples uh, that we are receiving changed our decision boundary or not. Uh, so if there is some kind of uh, concept uh, tied to some model, how can I really uh, take care of it? Uh, things like KS distance, A distance can be used, uh, model dependent monitoring where I can consider the margins uh, between uh, the different classes uh, in the data. And the most important we can say, we have the learning part. Uh, how really do we manage our models when we know that there is a concept drift around? So there are uh, many ways to do that. We'll go uh, into it uh, more specifically in a minute, but basically we can do things like uh, retraining. We can have one model that is being retrained. We can use uh, ensembles that will do some kind of prediction with the knowledge of concept drift. Uh, there are many <coughs> adaptation methods uh, that uh, will go into it. So as we look on the whole system, really we can see that in any part of both uh, the system itself, getting the samples, tracking them, weighing them, estimating the loss between our uh, learner and what we expect, a change detection uh, mechanism, and the actual uh, models, each one can have its own uh, place uh, where it can be uh, fitted into a concept drift uh, situation. Uh, so we can take the usual uh, parts that we have in our model uh, and while creating the model and basically tune them in a way that make this a concept drift aware system and that we'll be able to uh, handle it uh, you know, by design. Let's go to the next slide. So on how to detect a virtual drift, there are, uh, I just want to show uh, some uh, examples of uh, methods. So when we're talking about the virtual drift, we are actually talking about priors. We're talking about our feature vectors, all the samples that come in. So there are two ways that we can really track them. Uh, if we uh, have the labels, we can do things, uh, apply things like statistical methods, uh, we can do total variation distance, we can create histograms uh, and do all kinds of uh, distribution matching uh, uh, coefficients, uh, such as the CAS distance, CAL divergence, uh, so total variation distance. On the other hand, we can also apply our own models or our own ensembles into tracking this as we can uh, have a clustering algorithm running over the data uh, where it can actually try to create new clusters and we can uh, consider the relations between different clusters that we see in the data. Uh, and by that uh, kind of finding out either when a new cluster emerges, when we have a new kind of uh, samples that we didn't see before, but we can also track things like how those uh, clusters are moving throughout the space and how uh, the relation changes uh, to give us some kind of alert. Uh, now, those methods, as you also see in the demo soon, uh, basically sit on our incoming stream uh, and they enable us to have some kind of knowledge when the prior is uh, changing. Go over please to the next one. So now we go into the actual uh, concept drift, what we call uh, the real drift. And there are also uh, many different methods that we can apply here. Uh, usually when we're talking about uh, the real drift, as I said, we need to have uh, the labels for some kind of uh, way to let us know how the relation between feature vector and the target variable changed, as this is what we are looking for. So we have a statistical methods, statistical process control that we can apply. An example is a DDM. A DDM is a drift detection method, an acronym, uh, uh, that basically what it does, it models uh, the number of errors that we receive from our model 
איזה בינומיאל וריאבל, ביטפורם סטטיסטיקס, and when it models it like that, basically it enables us to uh, know how much, uh, how much uh, actual errors, what is the error rate that we should expect. And the DDM basically set up boundaries uh, related to the standard deviation of the error, and when you move outside of this boundary, you get an alert. Uh, the same goes for page uh, Hinckley and Kamsam. Uh, basically, those are just, uh, they just provide different uh, kind of tests. Some are tracking the whole confusion matrix, what is the true positive, true negative, false negative rates, and how they are all uh, moving, also using all kind of sampling and correlation uh, uh, methods. Uh, so what's nice also about those methods is because they're tracking statistical changes, uh, things like uh, z-scores and uh, really how uh, the standard deviation change, we can easily uh, do also some kind of a warning zone and provide alerts even before a change is detected. Uh, the next we have time window distribution, another uh, way of looking at this problem. Uh, so there are solutions like paired learner learners. Uh, this is a really nice uh, solution where you have a big model that was trained on a lot of data. This is your stable model. And you have another model, uh, it can be even the same type, which is trained on relatively small and recent data. Now, uh, what you would look for is for times when the new model, the smaller one, actually is starting to perform better than the stable bigger one. Uh, because uh, the main idea is that if we have a stationary data everything looks the same and we give the model a lot of data, it should act better than a model that was trained on a very low amount of data. And if really the uh, smaller models start to outperform our stable model, there must be some kind of change in the concept that allows the small model on the recent data to capture this new concept where the stable model uh, really didn't see enough of uh, those examples, if at all, uh, or maybe, you know, it has its own uh, priors uh, to how to do the drift. Uh, another one is Edwin. Edwin is a method uh, that basically sits on the stream uh, of data and uh, it, <coughs> it uh, works on uh, the labels. What it does is it looks for changes in distribution between the recent time window and a uh, time window before. It will start to split this time window uh, to figure out where there are uh, concept drifts, where there are different distribution between uh, the old window and the new window. Uh, but what's nice is it will actually take the window that it thinks it has a, a concept change and we'll save it so we can use it in our, as our training data set. So we can end up with a lot of uh, different, we can say concept drift related uh, windows for our training data set. Uh, the last type of approach I'll talk about is contextual uh, approaches, uh, DOF or uh, tree features. Uh, tree features, for example, mean that we can uh, basically train a small decision tree uh, on our data and look if we have the timestamp as one of our features. And if the timestamp is an important feature uh, to predict on the data, we can assume that there was some concept change. Uh, so uh, the tree model kind of learned that one concept is on uh, the left side of the tree of the leaf and another concept is on the right. So if we see uh, such timestamp based uh, features, we can try and use this node that uh, the tree gave us in order to also split our data set and run all kind of uh, tech tasks uh, on top of it. Um, okay, can you move to the next slide? So we talked about uh, how to detect uh, virtual drift and concept drift. Uh, now we talked about how to remediate. So as we said uh, before, there are many, there are the four parts, they're all taking some part in how to uh, 
uh, make the system aware to console drift. Uh, here are a few examples of uh, how it looks like. So we have the ability to retrain our model. This is one way. Uh, we can retrain our model on newer data, or as we talked about, we have a selective memory porch like Edwin. Uh, it can be tied to a concept drift uh, detector that will basically trigger a new train of the data uh, every time a drift was detected uh, with the selective memory. Another method that we have to handle it is kind of a built-in method. Instead of taking the old model and basically throwing it away, what we are doing is we're building model ensembles. Uh, examples are Learn++, uh, C, or edX. Learn++ basically uh, does a time-based voting weights. So we continuously train new models, but instead of throwing everything away, we are just adding it into our ensemble. And uh, we have weighting on those votes in the ensemble based on uh, the time. So the last model created, is uh, the highest uh, weighted model. We can also do C, uh, train on new data, and basically every time we create a new model, we'll just drop the lower performing uh, models uh, on the data, or edX, which will, uh, once we have our own prediction for more voting, we'll basically use this as a trigger to add or drop uh, models. Another uh, way is model archiving, which is nice for the current drift. Uh, what it does is, uh, basically, when we retrain the data from some kind of uh, notice, uh, it will archive the model, not really retiring it, uh, but it will archive it, and whenever we think there is some kind of uh, change, it will test uh, the samples, the last samples, uh, on each model in the archive. So if we have a recurring concept, uh, and we already trained the model with this concept, like in seasonality, uh, it will uh, kind of know that, uh, oh, we're in a, a new season. I've already seen this uh, before, and it, the model that worked uh, uh, last time will uh, be used now automatically. Next time. Okay. Okay, so uh, now after we talked about all this uh, components, all those methods. Let's see a short demo. And in this demo, we want to really show the full life cycle of uh, MLOps uh, system that will uh, do uh, all the data science workflow, but with a concept drift in mind. So how will this work? We have a, a training part this uh, training part uh, will create the model. Uh, in this example, we'll show some network uh, monitoring uh, situation uh, where we train on metrics from uh, routers and we receive our model. After we have the model, uh, we want to deploy it into a serving endpoint. Uh, so we will take the model uh, and use Nucleo, our serverless uh, function framework, uh, in order to deploy it with ML1 as a serving endpoint, which will be able to receive requests from a stream and from HTTP uh, endpoint uh, and really uh, give us the predictions uh, in real time. On top of this, uh, of the serving system, uh, once it gives back the predictions, uh, it basically write them back into a stream uh, on the platform, which enables us both to send all those metrics into Grafana, uh, a dashboard that will show us live uh, what uh, the current predictions are, and also all the drift, uh, uh, drift tracking that we have. And of course, the model analysis, uh, what we talked about for the past uh, 40 minutes, how can we really sit on the stream of uh, our serving uh, function Track both all the incoming requests, the feature vectors, uh, apply the change metrics to them, uh, and also uh, <clears throat> read all the uh, results, all the predictions uh, that our model provide, track them too, uh, put them back into Grafana so we can view it and trigger a, a new training process, a new workflow uh, if needed. Uh, 
So, Sam, can you? Yes, I'm going to stop me? sharing and you can uh, open the demo. Okay. So, essentially, or you were showing that using essentially three functions, three serverless functions, you address the entire problem. The first function is the model serving. The next function is monitoring the model and doing more of the real time processing of the, the model uh, stream. And the third function is more of a batch, you know, periodic job that takes uh, bigger data sets, you know, with a, and analyze them and compress them with other reference data. So, yes, yes, I will show one serving uh, function. We have two functions uh, that do uh, our and virtual. They're all, uh, they're all, I assume, for the using uh, Nucleo as a serverless engine, and there's also jobs using what we call ML run, which is the, the, serverless, the job serverless function. Exactly. So, let's start by going uh, just a second over uh, the serving function. And I actually want to go over it and start showing you it uh, from our MLRAN functions repo. Uh, MLRAN enables you to basically uh, take code or notebooks and configurations straight from Git. So we have our uh, market, uh, our function repository, which you can get in. We have our model server uh, already inside, which is what was used to uh, load the model. Uh, we can read the uh, or can you know. increase the font there is a request to inside the uh, yeah okay uh, I hope it's better now yeah yeah okay so uh, as we can see basically uh, Nucleo has deep integration also MLRAN with uh, the notebook uh, so we can immediately deploy it and specify uh, different things we need the actual classifier model uh, is basically uh, how to load the model itself. So we have our pickle file that we created from the training and the prediction, which just does a uh, predict, it will return the response uh, and write it uh, to the stream for us uh, from returning. This is uh, coming free from MLRAN. We can test the model locally. Uh, so I can run this uh, function uh, as is uh, on the notebook. I can document and save it uh, and deploy it straight from the notebook. Uh, as in this example, where we actually do the deployment from uh, here. Uh, I just say that any one of you can really install Nucleo straight away, download this notebook and uh, use it on his own uh, computer. Uh, there is no magic about it. Once we're done uh, setting up the function, so it will also uh, get really uh, an address and we can see the actual function in our Nucleo uh, screen. This is from inside the platform uh, where this was actually deployed. So we have the function classifier uh, model. It receives uh, an event and predict from it. Uh, and we can see from the triggers that Nucleo automatically adds for us. We have an HTTP trigger. So this acts as a rest endpoint uh, for our function. So immediately any service uh, can just send events uh, to the send point and it will automatically uh, standardize them and we'll run our predict function uh, every time we receive a new event. Um, what's nice in Nucleo also is that this is already production grade, has auto scaling features and uh, a lot of other Canaries and a lot of things. But, and again, Nucleo is open source and everyone can uh, download and use it. Exactly. Uh, the next phase after we have our serving function, as we said, it returns the response uh, from the HTTP and also save it into a stream. The next step is our model uh, analysis. Uh, so as I said, we have two functions. Uh, MLRAN is deeply integrated uh, with uh, Jupyter and I'll want to show you a bit of how uh, those functions uh, work. So we have uh, at first our concept drift uh, detection function. This is basically a nuclear function. Uh, it will have a- increase the, increase the font? Please. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, okay. Uh, so this uh, function will sit on top of our uh, inference stream the one that uh, the serving function uh, writes to. 
And for every event, it will try and uh, run some kind of uh, analysis. So the function has its initializing part. Uh, many of you, I guess, know uh, from Lambda. Uh, Lambda uh, serverless function basically are stateless, so you don't have this uh, part, but because Nucleo is stateful, uh, you can put things inside, you can do batching, and you can kind of set all your connections uh, inside on yourself. So you set up callbacks for the function if they are needed, we'll tell it which uh, stream do we need to actually uh, track. And we will add our list of models. And in this example, I'll use EDDM, uh, early drift detection method, page inquiry test, uh, and uh, drift detection method. Maybe another point, uh, all the code is in uh, our repository and uh, afterwards we'll send the link uh, to the code itself for anyone who wants to look into it. Yeah. The code, basically all the function will go into our ML run function, so everyone could uh, later on go and use them in their own uh, workflows. Uh, so I set it up, and for the first time I was setting it up, I also want to run uh, my test, uh, ba my base uh, data set, the one I trained uh, with the data, so the models will learn from the beginning what is the right distribution they should uh, look for. The next part is the actual handler, uh, where I receive an event. Every time uh, we do some prediction, it will be written into the stream. As we said, Nucleo automatically uh, listen to this uh, stream for me and gives me back my event. So I have my event, I construct the record to uh, the way I like it, and basically uh, I'll add the element uh, to I'll go over the list of uh, models that I put in, DDM, EDDM, page and clean, add the element and check, check if we have some kind of warning zone or a change was uh, detected. If that happened, uh, of course, we will alert our callbacks uh, and also we'll push all of uh, these uh, results back into our time series uh, database. Okay, and as you can see too, we can of course uh, check, test the function from here, sending it uh, some event from our stream. When was the prediction? Which class gave it? Uh, what is the name of our model? Uh, prediction uh, and the actual uh, feature vector that was sent with it. And to deploy it, I can uh, very easily nuclear deploy and deploy the function uh, into our uh, Nucleo. Uh, so let's here. jump into the virtual yeah. first one because we don't have a lot of time. So we... awesome. The next function is the virtual drift function. Uh, this is an ML run function uh, that basically uh, does uh, work on more batch, batch approach. What it does is it will uh, take the data set uh, that we have. It will receive two uh, data set, one a baseline T and the newer uh, one U. Uh, so it receives the original a base uh, uh, sample and also it will receive uh, some kind of uh, forget, last uh, whatever uh, time frame you want to check, uh, some data about uh, the stream. And what it will do is it will calculate our metrics like TVD, total variation distance, head injury distance, care divergence, and will uh, compute all those metrics uh, for us on top of uh, an observation uh, transformation that we are doing. Uh, basically, what we'll do is we'll take uh, all the feature vectors coming in, we'll discretize, show you, we'll take all the data coming uh, in, we will discretize uh, all the continuous features so we can really compare the distribution. So we are fitting all the different uh, features uh, to the discretizers. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we'll run all our uh, prediction, all our uh, statistical analysis, uh, basically point observation, run all our results. Uh, both for class, both from our priors and our uh, predictions. After we run that, we also push all the results to our time series database uh, so we can view it on Grafana 
and analyze uh, those results. Can you later. show it on, uh, on Hana? Again, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, so uh, as it pushes everything to Grafana, this is an example of uh, a Grafana dashboard that is running on top of our uh, data. I played so with it. Uh, so I, what you did is you had two functions. One is running in batch, one is running in real time and they push data into a time series database based on all the anomalies. And that uh, Grafana was sort of reading from the time series database and, and visualizing all the drift effects. Exactly. I so uh, as I said, the end of both functions, you're basically pushing to time series database uh, where I can uh, easily track all the different changes. So for example, we have our uh, concept drift on the accuracy, the first function, I can see the change detected, and so I can see the time frames. Here, uh, I just fix the labels to false on the data set, so we can see that it detected a change. Uh, we can also see all the warnings, uh, and we can really go to any time point and look at which model gives us uh, the warning. Total count of uh, how many warnings were given during the time period. Currently, we're updating over the last two days, five seconds uh, refresh intervals. Uh, we have our prior, uh, so we have our drift magnitude uh, by TVD, Henninger distance, uh, and we can see uh, how it changes through the time, different uh, data sets that I pulled in. Uh, that, that's pretty cool, uh, or, you know, two simple functions and you get all that information. Exactly. I think this is one of the really nice things that you can very easily just uh, write a notebook, see that your code works, and you can immediately hook it up into the system. And because everything talks to one another, uh, so it will automatically uh, add real uh, data. And, you know, so, so maybe me. just show us the, now the, the last part is that okay. essentially instead of doing it one notebook at a time, you've also preferred, I know, uh, sort of a pipeline, a fully automated pipeline. Yeah. Build the entire thing in, in one notebook. Exactly. Is enough if we want to make it even simpler. So, so we have the training serving all those model analysis, the notebooks I've shown you, and now I really show you how we can in one notebook really launch this whole pipeline and how it will look. I'll just go a bit out of uh, Zoom. Is it still okay, Aaron? Yeah, great. Okay. So we have our project notebook. Uh, in this notebook, I'm going to define an MLM project, uh, get the functions that I'm using, and basically deploy the full pipeline that enables everything you've seen up to now, uh, including the concept drift, the stream, and the tracking. So and you have some auto ML and feature detection and all that just for fun, I see. Just for fun and for you, I'll do it uh, this <laughs> time. So I've defined a new project. I can initialize it from Git or anywhere else. Uh, right now, I initialize it from uh, our local directory. As I open a project, the next thing I want to add is a set of functions that I want to use in this project. Now, the functions can be from a repository. As I showed you before, we have ML run functions uh, with all kinds of different uh, functions you can use. And this is automatically integrated into uh, ML run when you download it. Uh, you can go to hub, and once you say hub and the name of the function, it will get it for you. So what I'm doing in this pipeline, I'm going to do the following. I start with the feature selection. We have a feature vector after a lot of uh, aggregations, and we want to select the correct features. I'll describe the data set, both the raw data and after the feature selection, so I can see correlations uh, and all the parameters of our different features. After that, we'll go into our training. Uh, I'll use this classifier uh, that we have that really manages all the split uh, between the training, test, validation, uh, run hyperparameter search uh, on a few algorithms. We'll choose the best one uh, and provide us with the model we need. After we have the training part ready, we've made our model, we'll test our classifier. We need to evaluate it, see what the actual accuracy results are. When we confirm that we have our uh, model and we want to use it, we'll use our model server, the function that we've seen uh, before, just um, a few minutes ago, uh, taken from the hub, we'll take our model and make it into a nuclear function. And once we have the function, we want to make sure that the uh, 
uh, the endpoint is live. We want to both see that we can get requests. We want to see that if I check for some sample, I receive the same thing as I expected to locally. And also I want to check for latency. Uh, the next okay, part after we, we, have, uh, or we really don't have a lot of time, so let's just okay. skim through that. Again, what you see here is a full automation of an extremely complicated uh, pipeline with auto ML, auto feature selection, auto analysis, auto deployment, auto testing, everything. And it's using the Kubeflow pipeline methodology for essentially creating a graph uh, of defining that uh, pipeline. As you can see, it's, it's relatively simple uh, once you get the hang of it. And then maybe just show us the graphics that is after you deploy. You get like yeah, a real Yeah, so, yeah, so just have this pipeline, we can get, grab outputs from different uh, parts and run it. When we run it, we'll get into this actual pipeline uh, configuration. Uh, so we describe the data, feature selection, uh, describe after the feature selection, train the data, test the model, deploy our uh, server, test the endpoint, uh, with the test set that we received from our training uh, and the endpoint that is now live and deploy this concept drift uh, function. Whenever you see deploy, we actually mean deploying. This will actually create the Nucleo endpoints uh, like here and we'll set up the functions uh, that at the end of the day uh, operate and uh, really provide us this real uh, time system uh, with all the tracking and everything that we've seen. We can also see uh, the tracking through the MLRAM UI. I can see all the different uh, jobs. So when I describe the raw data, I can see all the different artifacts uh, that were made. And of course, to see all the different uh, tests and for example, to see what the latency was uh, during my uh, training. So we also have all of that. Uh, tracked right into our uh, ML. So, uh, anyway, uh, because we don't have a lot of time, you can always follow up on that for anyone that's interested. Uh, but we have a few questions that uh, AC people are starting to leave, but uh, let's start trying to address the, um, the questions that we have. Okay, uh, Sar, do you want to read the questions on? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so um, one question here is, where do you draw the line between drift and discontinuity? I can't help but think of the boiling a frog joke. What I really want to know is, when does it make more sense to scrap a model than to tune its drift? So, uh, you know, as everything in real life, uh, this is a bit of a complicated uh, answer. Um, you need to test it. Uh, throughout the line in concept drift, the main consideration uh, usually is uh, between getting all kinds of false alarms and outliers and really when these outliers are the concept that I'm looking for. Uh, you can have one example of someone uh, with features you don't know and it will be, and uh, it's an outlier and that's okay, every model has outliers. Uh, you need to think about when it's actually concept drift uh, and this is really the uh, hard point. At the end of the day, you need to uh, prepare some uh, data sets, look at your data. Uh, I always advise uh, try and use uh, a few methods. Each one has its own uh, queries. Each one uh, looks at the data in a bit of a different way. And when you think uh, that some type of change may apply to you, try and track it from really all uh, directions and uh, identify uh, throughout those different metrics really what applies uh, to you currently. Great, thank you all. Uh, we'll take two more questions. What drift detection methods do you recommend for multi-label classification? Um, so I'm not sure if uh, the multi-label classification is uh, exactly uh, the determinant factor here. Uh, basically, what you are more looking at is the type of the drift that uh, you're having, uh, rather than whether it being binomial or multi-class. Uh, you can, for example, deploy a few type of uh, ensemble methods, like uh, I've talked about before, uh, the run++ and the C, uh, and 
basically handle it uh, this way without actually uh, relating to the fact that it's multi-class uh, or not. And maybe I want to highlight one point that may have been sort of overlooked. You know, uh, Or is a data scientist, uh, very talented, but I think what you've seen that he builds something that he would take about uh, four or five people in a regular uh, organization, because you need a DevOps guy, machine learning engineering, uh, data engineer, et cetera. But because we had all the automation around it and all the ML ops, he was capable of building this demo in a few days where most of the complexity, complexity was around the actual math and data science and all the plumbing stuff was fully automated or uh, or. Yeah. Uh... I would say that this is uh, extremely helpful. The way that uh, you can see uh, it's all integrated, it enabled me to write, as we say, mostly business logic, targeting the actual question, thinking, spending most of the time thinking about the actual problem, the type of drift, doing analysis uh, on data, and really do some kind of rapid prototyping and very easily adding new methods uh, every time that you know uh, you think about something new at the end of the day you do a lot of research you read a lot of articles and you want to be able to implement uh, something new that you've learned right away you don't want to go through the hassle of uh, bureaucracy in uh, large organizations uh, and things like that uh, maybe you need to you know, connect to different data sources things that require a lot of work and here you can do this all automation uh, pretty much uh, very easily by writing business code uh, alone. Let's take just one last question. Can you elaborate um, on some methods used in change detection applicable to an industry use case? Um, okay, so... Uh, it can be any use When case. we talk about uh, the change detection, so even in a real uh, use case, let's uh, see, I've talked about, uh, I'm just trying to look for a, really a nice example uh, in my head, but uh, let's say when we talk about uh, how this change detection is uh, coming to be, uh, the main idea is that you, you have a model that is running some predictions and suddenly you receive a data and the accuracy goes off immediately. Uh, like we talked about the COVID, people looking for a corona, uh, you used to give people ads that are always showing corona, but now uh, when someone is looking for corona, is actually looking for the COVID-19 uh, things. So when you track a model, uh, if you take Google ads, for example, uh, we have a model that is predicting uh, corona uh, beer for a lot of corona searches, and the accuracy of that search really went uh, downhill very fast. Uh, so the statistical methods here, uh, especially in uh, ad tech industry, for example, could be applied, where you can immediately see that your uh, accuracy drops from uh, let's say 60% down to 30 or 20% because no longer uh, matches. Um, so I think that, as you see, the main idea is really to think about what can uh, change, what type of change I'm looking for uh, to see, how this behavior works, and then uh, you can match the detection method uh, to it and also all the different uh, thresholds uh, associated with it. That's great, thanks, Ol. And if you don't mind uh, moving to the next slide. Of course. So we're uh, really kind of at the end of our webinar. We've even gone a couple of minutes uh, over time. So thank you all for staying with us. Uh, we want to invite you to visit our MLOps page, iguazio.com slash MLOps, and you'll find links to the previous sessions. You can download recordings. Uh, you'll find blogs and videos and uh, lots of information uh, about MLOps. Uh, next slide, please. And we also want to invite you to our next session, which will take place in two weeks, and we're really looking forward to this one. We'll be joined by our friends David Aronchik, Head of Open Source Machine Learning Strategy at Microsoft, um, Marvin Buss and Xander Matheson from GitHub, 
and we'll discuss Git-based CI-CD for machine learning and MLOps uh, through a live demo of enabling continuous delivery of machine learning to production using Git-based ML pipelines, GitHub Actions, uh, with hosted training and model serving environments. I don't want to give too much away, but it's, uh, it's going to be really good. So look out for the registration link, which we'll email you in a couple of days, and we really hope to see you there. Um, we're sorry that we didn't get to address all the questions. If you like, you can email us at info at iguazio.com and we'll be happy to answer any that we didn't get to. And do let us know if you have any comments or feedback about today's presentation and if there are specific topics that you would like to hear about in our upcoming episodes. Yeah, and we'll um, send also a link to the code repository or uh, with, together with the email class. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much, Yaron and Ol, for this great session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and for uh, staying over time. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed it. And we'll uh, see you next time. <laughs>